Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the January episode of Innovation Insights. My name is Dale Brocious. I'm the Chief Executive, the Chief Commercialization Officer um, for IACME. Um, hope everybody has braved uh, the polar vortex as well as they can and looking forward to a little warm up over the over the coming week. Uh, we've got a great uh, lineup today, but uh, I'll start off with just a couple of um, quick things. Just a reminder about IACME and you know, our, our themes of convene, connect, and catalyze, bringing folks together, hooking them up, and then making things happen. So lots of activities around that, one of which is this um, webinar that we host, but our obviously our member meetings, our visits to other places as well. If you're not an IACME member, we encourage you to join. Uh, I, join IACME. It's uh, iacme.org slash members, where you can uh, start the process. Um, so one of the things about about it is we will we do support other organizations that we're very close to like SAMPI and JEC. We will be at JEC in Hall Six uh, in Paris in, in March, and at SAMPI in Long Beach in May. And don't forget our summer members meeting. If you're an active member, this is free to attend for every you know anybody you want to bring in your company. Um, we'll be in Indianapolis in August this year. It'll be a great time of the year to be there. We'll have a lot of fun activities happening there. And anybody who's been to one of our members meetings knows that we put on a pretty good show. Um, you do have to be a member to present in Innovation Insights. And we record all of those. They're all on our website. So you can get all the previous episodes right there um, under innovation on under IACME.org. So today we've got a lineup of great speakers. We've got four speakers, three, three uh, companies represented. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, this, which uh, and I'll have Joe Major, the CEO, and Neil Mitchell, the VP of Sales and Marketing, um, kicking us off. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll hand it to you, Joe. Thanks, Dell. So Neil, go ahead and pop our, our screen up. All right. Uh, uh, it's our pleasure to present here. I, I'm very, uh, very pleased to be a part of this group. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, wireless sensors today. Now, we're going to have a fair amount of this looking at uh, cure status and out time uh, management for prepreg. But we're also going to give a more general overview of what these sensors can do. Um, uh, we have been around now for seven years or eight years, something like that. Um, very good growth. Uh, the world of wireless sensing is really starting to take off and and leave the 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 lab and actually get into factories where um, it's it's very economical and it's very um, astounding and in the information it can bring about what's going on inside of your world and and inside of the things that you manufacture. Next. I think uh, we've already been introduced, so we can blow right past this one, uh, Neil. So our mission really is to provide data to people who make things. And I, that doesn't sound all that glorious, but there's a lot of big um, industries that don't have the kind of process data that would allow them to really, uh, really transform how they make things. So if you look at a bridge, a concrete bridge, or you look inside of a large composite structure, uh, the manufacturing of that is, is really experienced in an art form, but it's not really under process control because you can't see into that process. And that's what we're trying to, to help with. We're really trying to facilitate bringing statistical process control to people who make large things. Next. At this point, I'll turn it over to Neil, and he'll kind of walk you through what an ideal sensor would be, and then some of the capabilities that we have. So, if you take a look at some of the sensors that are used in the industry today, uh, most of them, all of them, really have either wires or batteries, or sometimes even both. Um, so, the technology that we have here, this ideal form of sensor, would be to have something which has neither has neither wires nor batteries doesn't require much in the way of maintenance, no batteries to change, for example, no wires to go wrong. It would be extremely small. And in this case, what's important is actually extremely thin. And you'll see why that's important uh, for composites shortly. 
um, but it also has the ability for uh, doing some data logging uh, in the uh, in the computer that's actually interacting with uh, with these sensors. And we're also we also deal with some additional sensors that we'll, we'll kind of touch on uh, during the presentation here. But this is kind of the ideal sensor, one that would actually be small, do some data logging, but be very inexpensive so that you can actually employ a lot of these across many different uh, sites, you know, through a structure or through some composite materials. So it's a bit like a, almost like a magic wand, you know, if we, if we wanted an ideal sensor, you know, it would be teeny, it would be thin, uh, it would report lots of data and uh, it would be inexpensive. So if we take a look at the different forms of sensors that that um, we have access to as an organization. The sensor that I've just been talking about is actually based on radio frequency identification technology. Um, so it's powered by a reader or a, an antenna, which is you know, 10, 20 feet away. So you don't need to actually get a wire into this thing because it's basically being, being powered by RF radiation. Um, and uh, the nice thing about these guys is that they, they can live for a long time. Um, Normally, 50 years, there's no reason why they couldn't last last more. Again, there's no battery to, to run out. Um, range is about one to five meters, as we kind of just mentioned. Um, strictly speaking, there's there's very little memory on here. There is actually memory on these things, but probably not enough for, for data logging in the true, true sense of the word. Um, but there are other technologies uh, that certainly do that. And we do have a reasonable refresh, uh, refresh rate of about 100 to maybe 500 hertz or so. Um, and in terms of actually providing the location data and, and, and positional data, it's really not the, the strong point of this technology. However, as an organization, we also have access to additional uh, types of sensors. And uh, we kind of wrap these into either Bluetooth or um, ultra wideband type sensors. And sometimes they can be combined, quite frankly, as well. But these types of sensors all have batteries in, so they start to become a little bit more bulky they do become, you could argue, more capable in some ways. So they can certainly do data logging because they do have a lot of memory and they have the battery there to constantly uh, update memory, which can then be interrogated later. Um, and the lifetime, because they, are, they have batteries, tends to be more limited. You have to take uh, the batteries out and change them. Um, and, uh, but the range, on the other hand, is, is much larger. And we're giving a range here, say 50 to 100 meters, although quite frankly, it could even be in certain cases even more than that. Um, as we said, data logging is possible. You can kind of see the refresh rates here. Um, some of these technologies are also nice because they start to give you positional information, which can be important. So relative to the reader that's accessing these, you can then locate these things down to maybe plus or minus one meter in the case of Bluetooth and maybe down to about 10 centimeters, you know, four inches in the case of uh, ultra wideband. But you're sacrificing here something which is being a little bit more bulky um, versus something which is very, very, very thin. Um, in terms of capabilities that we have with these sensors, and again, we're focusing a lot really just on these ultra thin sensors here. It's actually quite surprising the, the capabilities these things can offer. And you'll see why this is important for composite materials uh, in, a, in a few minutes here. But we can start to provide all kinds of information about the condition of the environment that these sensors are in. We can provide information such as temperature, the relative humidity um, strain. So we can actually tell what type of a strain uh, an object is going through. Uh, we can also tell the index or refraction, and that's actually useful for composite materials because, as you can see in the little chart here, uh, we're actually looking at index or refraction, and the uh, the big delta here, the big change here, is actually the introduction of resin into uh, the environment this particular sensor was resident in. So there's no resin at this point, and the index or refraction that's been detected by one of these sensors and report it as soon as the, the resin is being introduced. We have other capabilities. We can also measure capacitance and uh, and pressure as well. So we can even uh, tell when something's being pushed on. And again, that can be useful for certain structural uh, elements. The other nice thing about these sensors is they are all real time. 
Uh, so this information is coming at you. And as you, as you saw on a previous slide, we're talking about 100 hertz, 500 hertz in some cases. And you may not need that much information coming out of these sensors, but that's certainly the, the, the capabilities of them. And these are embeddable into structures and materials. And this is where we, we started getting a lot of interest from folk because we can start to place these sensors because they are so thin, either on the surface of molds uh, or actually uh, potentially inside of the layers of the, uh, the fiber uh, of the material that's actually um, going into the, to the composite material. And so we can actually start to uh, take a look at it with these sensors just across the structure that's, that's being uh, manufactured, the composite, but we can also look at it in a depth perspective as well. So, so we can actually have these sensors at different depths and actually report on these in, in real time. So we start to get a picture of the length and, and width, and, but also potentially the, the depth of what's going on with this material. Has the re resin arrived at this particular point, at this particular sensor? Has it gone through a gel transition? Is it a solid? Is it cured? So we can start now using the sensors to provide that kind of information. So the types of applications that we're involved in, um, we do a lot in the, the world of energy, and that's a very broad area, but um, renewable energy uh, pipelines, uh, we're, we're already working in those kinds of areas. Um, these sensors are also good in healthcare, uh, perhaps, you know, obviously temperature and humidity are important to understand if uh, they're getting ingress into certain drugs or things like that. Uh, we're also working in the area of aerospace, um, so we're doing uh, quite a bit with uh, you know, military aircraft and things like that. And uh, because these sensors, you can obviously see that, you know, because they're doing temperature and things like that, I mean, obviously they're going to be useful for uh, cold chain type applications. Uh, you know, is your fruit arriving okay? Um, are your pharmaceuticals arriving okay? Have they kind of gone out of temperature range? Similar for agriculture. And in construction, we're also working in the area of uh, concrete, for example. Uh, so we can kind of view that in some ways as a composite material, but we can also report on the what's going on inside of the material. So with that, I'm going to hand back over to, to Joe. Okay, so let's quickly go through um, some examples of this in uh, commercial applications. You guys can read this pretty fast. Uh, a couple of them are going to be directly in the composite world. Uh, a couple of them are going to be general wireless weight is, is uh, inventory tracking. And then we'll talk a little bit about strain uh, in the world of aero parts. Next. Okay, so <laughs> this is animated. So this is what our sensors are looking at in a closed mold cure. So uh, the first thing that we do is these sensors are, are spaced throughout the mold so that we can uh, map the uh, epoxy flow rate, uh, where it arrives, make sure that there's no dry spots. Um, we're tracking in the cure uh, both the, the phase of the um, cure and the temperature of the local region. Uh, this one is done completely passively without local heating. In, in most manufacturing procedures, uh, these are also tracking uh, the temperature that is achieved inside the mold at specific locations when heaters are turned on. So um, that is a single sensor. Uh, Neil mentioned other sensors in closed mold uh, work now. We're developing pressure sensors so we can look at um, the, the level of vacuum reached and what the vacuum does when the epoxy is turned on, getting into those sort of uh, details. We've also embedded strain um, so that we look at the strain profiles during cure. And one of the things that's very true about uh, these cures is that uh, epoxy as a material, fiberglass as a material, a lot of these things do not conduct heat. So you can get very, very high thermal gradients and that leads to baking strain uh, into these parts. So we've only shown you one one uh, sensor here and it's a sensor, it's a tag that has temperature and material properties on it. 
but other sensors have been added here too to provide additional information. The last thing is uh, over time, you'll see us migrating to measuring index of refraction directly so that you can, this will mimic the work that was done in the 70s and 80s and 90s, looking at the dielectric constant of materials as they chemically changed. We'll be able to do that um, very economically, no wires, no batteries. It'll be very, very, uh, very, very nice. Next. <clears throat> so in the world of pre-preg, uh, there's not a single thing to keep track of. There's a whole series of, of questions that are useful. One is, um, uh, where is the role or where is the part? So location is is really important throughout the manufacturing process here. And this is more important actually in smaller labs that have a high mix of parts they make um, than very, very large factories that have fewer parts and higher volumes. Um, the other thing that you have to track is roll freshness. Uh, and that basically is looking at a detailed history of the temperature. Right now, people somewhat guess at that by looking at out time. And what you do there is you're very conservative about out time and you end up throwing away material that's probably still good. The other thing that's interesting to know, if you know the freshness and the location of each roll, is you can say to a person on the floor, for this particular part that you're laying up, use that roll and here's the location of that roll. And finally, um, in autoclaves, there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, work or uh, there's a lot of uh, value that can be brought if you know the exact temperature of each part in the autoclave. And uh, again, for people who are making very few parts in high volume, that's not so important because you can do a detailed thermal map. However, if you have high mix um, and not a lot of rep re repeatability in what's put into the autoclave. It's very handy to uh, be able to look at each part. So next, we're going to look a little bit at roll freshness and location. So Neil, why don't you cover this one, and I'll take it after that. Neil, I think you're on mute. Thanks. Um, as we kind of hinted at uh, before, um, what we can do with this technology is actually track the the roles uh, initially the roles and eventually we end up tracking all the other components as, as joe hinted at but we can track the roles uh, throughout um the, the the early part of the manufacturing process and because we these these uh, sensors have a unique id that that enables this um, this tracking <clears throat> and basically the, the read is an antenna can then tell you yes you're closer to this antenna so therefore you're you're still inside the refrigerator or you've, or you've come out through the <clears throat> through the refrigerator door and you're outside the other nice thing is because these same locate locating ability sensors have the temperature built in and, and moisture for that matter we can now start to report that oh look the you know, temperature starting to go up on this roll and maybe that's planned uh, or maybe it's not. And um, so we can start to, to use this data to build up a model of what's going on with that particular role. Okay, we're gonna start increasing, you know, or maybe decreasing how much time um, it has left on that particular role. Now it's been out and it's reached a certain temperature and we can actually accelerate that based on temperature. So all of that data starts to, allow, to give us the ability to start reporting and providing alerts uh, to, to to folk around the, the manufacturing uh, facility uh, is something warm enough uh, has, has moisture got into a role when it, when it shouldn't have um, you know, is the product still good is it stale um, you know is it fresh enough to use and all of a sudden you, you, this has been this technology allows you to automate this process so um, it takes the, the the element of of you know human being involved out of it Joe, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, so we have strain gauges, uh, and uh, they have many applications. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, a wireless strain gauge can be used to make a scale. So you can weigh how many parts are in a, a drawer without uh, opening the drawer, as an example. It's also scalable to larger weights. And so for the for transportation, for manufacturing, 
wireless scales um, are now now easy to do. Next. So now let's talk about stuff that's a little bit more fun and a little bit more sexy. Uh, keeping track of things in a factory that's a, a good ERP system. What we're talking about here is taking advantage of real-time strain to move into um, really tracking parts while they're working. So a strain gauge can be embedded in a bridge. So you can actively measure the strain that happens when uh, vehicles pass over a spot in a bridge kind of for the first time. That's enabled because we have a fast acquisition speed. These sensors uh, can rattle off strain readings at 500 times a second. Um, we're already working in, in aerospace. Obviously, that's a place where strain is really critical and the aging of parts really critical. And there what's happening is strain gauges are being uh, developed to basically embed into parts. And while the aircraft is in the air, measure... Uh, the performance of the part of, from afar. So we're not touching the part. We're not interfering with the part. The part can be moving and we can still be picking up uh, data about the health of the part um, very unobtrusively. Um, this works uh, well with metal, uh, carbon fiber, or fiberglass parts. We have to change the sensor somewhat, but it's really an interesting world of uh, getting into the parts and looking at the part and its fatigue over time in operation is, we think that's pretty damn cool. Sorry for the language here, but it is a really fascinating thing that we're doing there. Next. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk on this real briefly and then I'll flip it back over to Neil. Uh, most of the work we do here uh, are, they're in factories. Uh, we love factories and love supporting factories. Um, bringing wireless sensing into a factory often opens up a series of insights that people aren't um, really didn't have uh, available, and it allows them to think very deeply about things. Um, that, in a lot of places, that brings uh, uh, process control capabilities that didn't ex exist before. Uh, I see a question coming in. We'll get to it in a second. Um, since this is, is kind of unique here, we make our own hardware, we make our own software and firmware, and we have a really interesting ecosystem of sensor vendors that allows us to bring a, a very rich uh, uh, capability into the factories to work this. Neil, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, I think, for the concluding slide, right? Uh, you're back on mute. Thanks. Um, I know we're a little bit short of time, so we'll probably go over this pretty quick, but yes. Uh, so this will just give you an idea of some of the, the tools that we have uh, as part of our portfolio in terms of the hardware, but we will need to also understand that what we do is provide a, a bunch of expertise behind this so we can come in and do on-site reviews uh, of what you're trying to achieve, what's your particular environment, and, and give you some suggestions on which type of sensor is the right sensor to use, because there's there's a variety of them, so we, we can help you with that. And then we can help with uh, doing everything from, you know, the prototype, proof of concept, and and the, the rollout. Uh, so really the message there is, you know, ask us questions and, and we can come in and, and implement, uh, you know, the appropriate system for your particular environment and your particular application. Uh, that kind of wraps us up. We, we do have one question, and I don't know, Dale, how exactly the – Thing works but i'll just go ahead and answer that and then i'll turn it back to you dale and so the question is does a strain gauge embedded in a composite create a weak spot and in general putting anything that's not structural inside of something that is creates a, a weak spot that said um when we're looking at monitoring things the placement of the uh uh gauges and the choice of where they go is made really carefully. So uh, in in those applications, no, we're not screwing around with the strength of the part at all. Uh, and what we're measuring uh, can be thought of as a passive measurement and not messing around with the strength of the part. In most composite manufacturing situations, the uh, sensors are placed on the surface and are actually removed when the part's done. And because they're so thin, I mean, they're you know, 100 microns thick, 
Um, they don't really even make much of a ripple in the skin, the, the top surface of the composite. So Dale, I'll turn it back over to you. I don't know uh, how you answer Q and A's or, or yeah. those. Well, we are, uh, you know, we're kind of running over a little, a little bit late. Time, so we'll yep. need to move on. What I would ask you to do is, uh, is there is a question in the Q and A panel. If you go in and answer that. Uh, oh. And, and then, um, and then uh, I've got a question or two, but I'll put those in the Q and A panel. You can answer those as well. Okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. Our next speaker is going. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Neil. Okay. And Neil, and if folks out there do have a question, you can go ahead and put it into the Q and A panel or in the in the uh, chat, and we'll have these guys monitoring that to, through the rest of the show. Okay. So we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker is Hisham Gosan. Hisham's the uh, founder and CEO of Endeavor Composites. And based in Knoxville. And uh, before I let him get started talking, I just want to thank him for two years of service as a small medium enterprise representative to the ACME Consortium Council. He was elected a couple of years ago, and, and we appreciate his service in that. So, Hisham, I'll let you uh, take the stage. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, IACME, for all you do for everybody, especially small medium enterprise. That's I act me being an amazing platform for me and other colleagues that reaped up a lot of benefits. I encourage all those watching to join. It's a good platform to expose your industry to other people and your company to other industries, and that will be great. And that's part of what I'll be talking about today is startups in general, as you know, like 50% of them fail within three years, more fail within the five years. Why? It's because of this dip we call the valley of death. You have to cross this desert of requirements and things that needs to get you over the bridge. So uh, here we go. What's the importance? Before I would go into the valley of death, what is a hard tech startups and what makes us different from any other startup? Because, you know, there is millions of industries. We are innovating in a critical field. That's field that's more in the tangible side, infrastructures. We're working with advanced composites for aviation, transportation, electronics, uh, circuit boards. You know, all of these that are very critical for the advancement of the economic growth. Uh, we have a long-term impact. You know, they invented the light bulb in the 1800s, and today we work 24-7 thanks to it. Uh, you know, we're not restricted to sunlight. These kind of inventions that drive scientific advancement to the next level. So how do we differ from other startups to each their own importance, of course, but we have more of a technical complexity as a hard tech companies. Uh, we have longer development cycles. That's why you don't see as many companies comes out quick as software companies. Uh, we have a higher initial investment and risk. You have to build a factory to produce a gadget. That factory requires equipment, requires people, requires regulatory challenges. Uh, are you being environmentally friendly? What are you doing there? What are you producing? Is it healthy? Is it not? Right, and then there is the market adoption rate. You invented a bicycle, but do people need a bicycle? That's the question that every startup must always ask themselves. How quickly people are willing to buy my bicycle versus other bicycles that are out there? So the most famous graph, and uh, I stole it from another LinkedIn post, but it's, you create something, and when you create it, you be happy, all high, but this is your zero point to start. Then you go in this dip where you start finding out that, yeah, not everybody cares or people care, but they want something slightly different. So how do you morph and model to reach back the point of zero? Then once you have a product that people want, that's when you scale and you harvest. So that's what brings a longer development time of getting different iterations and adjusting your product to be acceptable. And that's what difficult to attract investment because in general, investors want a quick return on their investment and 
high cost R and D isn't always the fastest way to get to a product. So, to give a live example about my own startup, uh, what do we do at Endeavor? What we saw was in the beginning with every industry when they produce something, there is an excess amount of material they couldn't sell. In the carbon fiber universe, that's 30% of their production. This is called off-spec fibers. And uh, so we collect those. That was the initial hypothesis, is to collect those, chop them, turn them into a non-woven fabric. Then this non-woven fabric can be made into a composite part. And our technology was special from all other non-woven manufacturers that are out there that we can process the fibers at one inch or 25 millimeter for those who use international units. We have a patented process. We can tailor the non-woven, how heavy the fabric is. It's a high output because we're gonna use a paper making machine to do it, low cost of production and have those turnkey preforms. And this is an example of a incline wire wet laid machine. That's what we use. Those are normally used to make toilet paper, so they have very high production uh, volume. They can run up to 300 feet per minute. That's 100 meter per minute at the width of the machine. Uh, so what's special about long fiber? You'll be Hisham, that's great. You made something with long fiber. So what does it mean? With longer fibers, you have a better tear resistance. And with better tear resistance, you can now take those rolls of fabric give it to another composite manufacturer that can pull it through their system. And when they pull it through their system, you have, you won't tear it apart like you would do with a piece of paper. So that was a key problem that we solve so people can process these fabrics at high speed without having issues. But eventually as we start working, and that's the key in the valley of death, when you try to take different paths, we find out that maybe it's not just carbon that we need to look at. We start looking at single fiber solutions like basalt fiber, glass fiber, carbon fiber, natural fiber. What is the application that the client wants? Can we do a multiple different products? And which product is faster to go to market? Then we looked at commingled where we mix the thermoplastic fiber with the reinforcing fibers so we can consolidate it at one shot. And last but not least is we created a hybrid where we have multiple reinforcing fibers together that can be, for example, recycled carbon and natural fibers to increase the green factor, to cre create different properties that are homogeneous and eliminate delaminations. So with these kind of products, our first success rate was with the transportation and automotive, where they were focusing more on green solution, reducing the weight of metal they use, and that our product can process same way as sheet metal. You want to create to your client the least headache possible in adopting your material. <clears throat> Next step was in the construction. We looked at interior division, at ceiling tiles, we're collaborating today with another startup in Knoxville, uh, Sky Nano. I give them a big shout on multiple projects in that field. As well, we looked on marine and uh, the boat hull here. How can we reduce the weight on it so we have a faster boat because it's more fun and a greener boat? Who said green have to be boring, right? And last but not least, of course, the hypersonic area, which is a very hot topic, uh, pun intended, uh, today. And we've been working a lot with the US Air Force on that. So how do you make it as a startup? That's the main question. The most important is to locate yourself in a good ecosystem, right? And uh, the East Tennessee ecosystem has been perfect for us. We are co-located with IACME's headquarters. This picture was taken there with Dr. Vadia, the chief technology officer. And uh, this facility have gave us state-of-the-art access to equipment, a space for us to put our own equipment, which was magnificent. It's affordable, so we were able to get on our feet, reducing the cost. 
We are within close proximity from Oak Ridge National Lab with their facilities and their throve of intelligent people that we can discuss with and brainstorm and guide us. And I can't forget, of course, University of Tennessee, their research foundation, their fiber composite manufacturing facility, and other facilities where we were able to lean on them to validate the product in R&D and testing. That's valuable because you cannot form a product without those facilities, and they cost a lot if you're not in the right place. The next step is strategies for survival. As you know, for a profit company, money is everything, but you don't have a product yet to sell. So what do you do? Luckily in the United States, and, and of course in some other nations, but at least here, we have the Small Business Innovation Research Grant Program, uh, the Seed Fund of America as the NSF call it. And we're very grateful for NSF, NIOSH, Innovation Crossroad Program through Oak Ridge National Lab, AFWorks and Launch Tennessee, Together, they, we got grants over two and a half million, uh, and those get us over the hill in increasing the number of employees, purchasing equipment, getting validation of data, and all of that that get us to a product. And of course, you have to pick which grant to apply for as a startup because not all of them are suitable for everyone. And you don't want to do a shotgun process as well. You want to be focused. So in the next step was engaging the industry and attending strategic conferences. Um, here's a couple of pictures with people who are close to my heart. I want to give a shout out to Dylan. Dylan is my processing engineer. And Tyler has been a great mentor for me, as well as Ed uh, from Magna. Uh, this picture was taken in CAMEX, attending the ACME members meetings, being involved with the industry, talking to them is the most biggest key because you want to hear from your client what they need. It doesn't matter what you produce. If they don't need it, you're wasting their time, you're wasting your time. So listen to them, hear what the product is they want, and go manufacture that. Solve their problems. That's what's important and be part of their business development idea. That's the key. And be strategic in who you choose to talk to. Talk to everyone, but who you choose to work with because you don't want to bite more than you can chew. Another thing that startups can take advantage of, and we for sure did that, is how do you sculpt and re-sculpt yourself? Uh, we participated in mass challenge accelerators. Uh, we were in three programs with them, Creative Destruction Lab through their uh, commerce stream, Greentown Labs, we did the Go Move and the Go Build program, and Lately Generator with their 1915 studios that's sponsored by Georgia Pacific. These programs gave us a lot of mentoring from larger corporation that helped tune and hone our message it gave us purpose, it gave us access to perks, money even, uh, like Greentown Labs, they were like, if you're selected to the program, there is a cash award. Uh, the mentoring that came from that, the access to equipment, software, and other perks has been phenomenal to get us over the board. And sometimes you have to listen to them. You have to destroy what you have to rebuild a new, like, if someone tells you your product is not going to work and they gave you the logic reason why, listen to them. That's it. I kept it small for open more room for discussion and would we'll love to hear your questions. Thanks, Hisham. Yeah, always good to see, uh, you know, a story, you know, a success story, but understanding that that success comes with obviously lots of heartburn and and, and lots of hard work and you know and yeah you, know, you have to have a thick skin in this industry <laughs> and it's not always the uh the the direction you thought you you, you might go in, in in the first place you know from a i had a question what from a um a commingled standpoint what do you, what, you know what are you seeing the most demand for in um in commingled requests so in that's been high temperature carbon glass 
Mix yeah, and that's and that's the it. trick. Yeah, and sometimes I had to turn down some requests because yeah. for me, I was like, yeah, even if I don't see a final solution for it, sometimes you don't want to drag it. But like, if you're working with carbon, for example, you want to mix it with a high engineering thermoplastic. It doesn't make sense if cost is that critical that you have to mix carbon and uh, low density polyethylene. Yeah, your product is not suitable for carbon. You know, like that doesn't make sense. They're too contradicting. Carbon is too expensive for your product anyway. If that is the helis heel, the cost on the matrix. So you want to match materials that make sense for the final product. We've seen a lot of good requests on high engineering plastic, like Peak, for example, with carbon fiber. And we've seen a lot of requests for natural fiber with polypropylene mm -hmm. in the transportation industry or PA6 at best. So it depends again on which area you're working with. Is it aerospace or is it transportation? And for that, you have to tune the special material that's more suitable for their price and the volume of production and for the properties they are seeking. Because you don't want an overkill. The whole purpose of using a non-woven is you're avoiding the overkill of performance in woven. If your part requires that overkill of performance, by all means, you have to use woven fabric. Okay. The um, other question I've got is uh, aerial weight. You know, what, what's the lowest in no. that you've been successful with, you know, that still gives you reasonable yeah. pair strength and it won't shear? And then, so, uh, what's the highest? Theoretically, yeah, theoretically, and we've tried it, it works, but we haven't been focused on. You can go as low as 10 GSM, but there is already great partners to us, other non woven manufacturers who are working with the 10 to 120 GSM. Our focus has been more on the higher end, the product that's not yet in the market. We're looking at materials that can be used to build a composite with, not just a veil surface veil. So we're looking us, ourselves at 200 to 500 GSM. This is the ballpark we chose to focus on because that's underserved in the industry. Okay. And this way we can partner with other players instead of competing, which used to be friends, not enemies. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you again, Hisham. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And glad to be here with everyone. Great. Okay. And our uh, third and uh, final speaker for today's episode is Lou Dorworth. Lou, I've known for a very, very long time with Aberus Training Resources. He's the division manager of direct services there. And Lou, if you can fire your presentation. And... Okay, Dale, thank you very much. You I'm, I'm, on I've clicked on the right one here, so we'll share. And can you see it okay? Logo. I haven't seen it come pop up yet. There okay. it is. There yeah, just give it a second. Yep. All right. Good. Um, good morning, good afternoon, um, whatever your time zone. Uh, we're, uh, Aberis has uh, done advanced composite training uh, in the industry since 1983. Dale and I, of course, go way back. Um, we've been uh, involved in the composite community since before that time. And uh, we certainly uh, do a lot of training worldwide. Um, one, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about Aberis is that we, uh, we have roots. I'm going to skip the speaker introduction. We have roots in Reno. Um, that's why we're located in Reno, Nevada. We, uh, we kind of uh, built our company out of the ashes of the old Lear fan program, um, which ran from the late 70s to 1983. The Lear fan was the first all carbon fiber airframe structure ever built and flown. And uh, it certainly was a pioneering uh, project for everybody. Um, Aberis itself was formed in 1983 at the end of the, the Learfan legacy. Learfan basically ran out of money, ran out of funding, and uh, couldn't take the aircraft to certification. So 
you know, we had many challenges in that program and it evolved to a flying airframe and it actually had the performance that uh, uh, was expected. It was one of Bill Lear's last projects. Um, and it was located outside of Reno in a little uh, airport, Stead Airport, um, where I worked for a good period of time from 1978 through 1983. So uh, that's where we get our, our background. I joined Avaris in 1989, uh, working for Bill Murphy at a, and then Mike Hoke at a different um, location than the Stead location. And then in 1991, the facility was moved uh, in through, from the north end of Reno to the south end of Reno and was renamed Aberyst Training Resources. So that's what we do business as today. And so I explain why Reno. Headquarters are located there in south Reno. We uh, have a facility <clears throat> large enough in Reno to run three full sets of courses at the same time. So our, cl our classes can um, independently run. We, we have, uh, you know, we have clean room, 30 rooms, classrooms for each of those three courses that are running. So we're up and running in Reno at our headquarters regularly. Every, every week we have a class or thereabouts. Uh, in Latin America, we also have a facility, and we run in conjunction there with the uh, uh, the the campus at Park uh, Technology Co. or Technology Green. Uh, it's the the Park of Technology in uh, in Sao Paulo. Our client base, just just so you can get a reference of who we serve. Uh, you can see there that the military DOD is probably our biggest client. Uh, airlines fall second. Uh, we, when we include aerospace and material manufacturers, that includes anybody making, um, you know, uh, composite parts or uh, possibly repairing parts in that sequence. Government agencies done a lot of classes for NASA and the FAA, uh, civilian repair stations, and then others. Now this. This uh, percentage data was generated a couple of years ago uh, prior to COVID. So these numbers are, are building in the others category. I'm sorry. So wind energy, motorsports, sporting goods, marine, et cetera. The programs we offer, we, we have a, a, a bunch of different courses that are structured under each heading that you see there. We have uh, composite engineering, design and analysis courses. Uh, we offer advanced composite manufacturing courses, a number of them. Um, advanced composite repair courses. We have eight on our menu currently that we run. And uh, probably out of all of those courses that we have there, the engineering and the repair courses are the most popular. Uh, the manufacturing courses also, um, uh, we have a, a slew of them that include adhesive bonding, tooling, resin infusion, a basic manufacturing, all of these things. It's our goal in every class uh, to uh, bring technology to the user to teach basics and advanced uh, methods and techniques so that the, uh, the student walks away with a higher level of confidence and the competence that they need to do their job. My job is to arrange for these services that are outside of our normal schedule. Anything uh, that would require on-site, which we do, we do uh, numerous on-site classes every year for the industry, uh, different um, industries, um, all involving composites. We have consultation services. We, we have been uh, involved in course development, facilities development, and product development over the years. We do have a train the trainer class, and uh, that's something that uh, uh, is pretty popular with those that are teaching composite subject matter um, in trade schools and otherwise. And uh, we, we have upped our game with the material process uh, consultation and training. 
here's why we are so successful. Um, we, you know, we've been in business since 1983 as a company. And uh, back then we started with one uh, repair class, kind of an intro class and uh, took that class from a three day to a five day class. And then over the next uh, 10 years or so, it, it, it evolved to a point where we had numerous classes and courses on the menu. Today, we have 23 off the shelf courses on our menu that include <clears throat> all of the topics that I had mentioned earlier. And so the biggest benefit that we have is that you can come to our training for one week, five day course, and learn enough in that five days, full full days, uh, at least four full days out of a five day schedule in which it's feed from the fire hose type learning. So we spend a lot of time uh, in the workshop validating the concepts and theories that we teach in the classroom. So the beauty of our programs is that we not only discuss theory, discuss techniques, methods, uh, materials, processes in the classroom, but we then go out in the in the workshop and we work with the students to actually build parts and, and what have you, uh, do repairs, uh, a number of things. Um, one of the biggest benefits of sending students to our training is that groups of students or um, you know groups of two that come through from a certain company uh, throughout the year, you get two uh, new employees you know, every month or every other month. Um, they go back with some formal training and it's all uh it, it is all uh, uh formal in the sense that they have the background and the information to uh get all of the group on the same page and this is important because uh, in-house on the job training does not allow for that where you have you know, you have one guy looking over the shoulder of the, the the newbie, if you will, trying to teach them how to do some kind of process of which, you know, another supervisor or another person trying to do that would, would have differences in opinion. Um, so what we try to do is we try to follow what is uh, most applicable in the industry and we have actually developed techniques that have become standard in the industry as a, as a result of the training that we provide. So I, I don't have time to go into a lot of that, but basically getting a group on the same page in a manufacturing facility or in a repair facility or in an engineering group is very uh, important. Um, our engineering courses are, are very popular. They generally book up months in advance and uh, they, you know, they're taught by an instructor that teaches real world design and analysis. Um, he, he has experience. He owns a company, an engineering company. He's the chief technical officer at that company, but he works for Abris, um about half, half the year as an uh, engineering instructor, you know, doing uh, classes at our facility and on site at customer facilities. So, our engineering is very strong. And one of the benefits that we see is that a student that has just come out of college, uh, he's probably got a, you know, uh, undergrad or a postdoc in his pocket, but he hasn't had the experience of the real world uh, uh, design and analysis at the level that we can teach in a short period of time. So they end up coming through our our classes and walk away with a, a ton of knowledge that they, you know, it's, it's like taking and flattening the curve for their learning um, for that, uh, that uh, design and analysis that they want to do. Our manufacturing courses, uh, mostly hands-on, like I mentioned, there's a lot that falls under the manufacturing bucket, which I'll talk about. Uh, we, you know, uh, you know, uh, we, we do hands-on actual building of parts um, in our courses. 
We allow the students to make mistakes and uh, learn from those mistakes here at our facility so that they don't learn from those mistakes with a high risk item back home. So this is a good way to, um, to get the tactile experience, get out there, cut plies, uh, build panels, you know, learn all of the difficulties. You can see that uh, uh, honeycomb core panel in fab. One of the problems with that panel design is that it has very steep uh, core ramp angles, which is a huge challenge. And it, uh, it, it opens the eyes of the main, uh, you know, the manufacturing uh, groups, uh, leads, supervisors as the complexity of doing a shape like that. Um, so th these are the kind of things we do. And of course, we we teach all about vacuum bagging and processing and all of that. We have an ad adhesive bonding course. Um, in this course, we focus on uh, the surface science, which is 90% of what you need to know, and then the adhesives um, and adhesive application, closing the joint in time, uh, applying pressure, you know, getting the uh, getting uniformity through the joint, all of these different things so that you have repeatable processes. Um, we have some support from a couple of different uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, plasma and uh, uh, contact angle measurement are part of our class that we uh, that we demonstrate. Uh, repair, I mentioned repair is one of our biggest um, draws. We we do uh, repair on actual structures, pieces of structure, so that um, those in the repair industry are familiar with the actual, what they're actually going to see. In fact, we, we teach them in detail uh, how to identify each material in a uh, in a panel so that they can go in and do a repair um, scarf to that repanel or to that panel and uh, obtain the right uh, scarf distance without the directions, but also when they have the directions, they understand what they mean. And 99% uh, of our, our groups do work to repair instructions and manuals. So when they read the manual, they already know what to look for and, and where to go. We also do hot bond repairs in that class. Uh, you can see there's something set up here on the right. Uh, we teach our students how to uh, set up all of the equipment, how to measure temperature, how to use temperature sources, et cetera, so that they can provide hot bonded repairs in the field. We, we do wind blade repair training as well. We've been doing it for years. Recently, we have uh, applied and we're in the progress of receiving uh, Global Wind Organization GWO certification. What that will do is that will be a portable certificate for any of the wind techs that come through um, our training and other training that uh, GWO provides. They have a certificate of their abilities, basically, their competencies that they learn in the class. This is one of our 10-day classes. The rest are five-day classes. So this, this class allows the those that have rope training to go up tower, you know, do repairs up tower in, uh, in uh, conditions that are, you know, that are uh, questionable when it comes to, um, you know, a normal composite room or a clean room type activity. A lot of challenges there. We're getting close to the end of the hour here. So I want to hurry up. We have a mold fab course. We use uh, low temp curing, high temp uh, capable materials. We use a variety of different patterns to make molds and fixtures, as you can see here. Um, we also talk about and teach uh, tool design methods for making the best uh, tools. And uh, that uh, is a very popular class as well. Resin infusion. We, uh, we picked up resin infusion probably 15, 20 years ago now um, when it was new to the industry right after Siemens. 
had uh, developed their patent. And after that, we we found many other ways to actually do resin infusion. We've been uh, involved with industry experts for years, and we teach those methods that are uh, you know best for the students. NDI course, um, we have uh, an instructoral level three instructor that does this course. Um, it, it takes you through uh, all of the techniques and methods that are out there. Here are some of them on the screen. And then of course, our engineering courses I mentioned earlier, um, of course, they're all 50% uh, or some of them are 50% in the classroom and 50% hands-on. Others are as low as 30% hands-on. We do material and process training. We have capabilities at our facility uh, to run an encapsulated specimen uh, rheometer, making coupons and collecting data and, and looking at the real-time uh, viscoelastic profile of what that uh, resin is doing during cure so that we can establish where in the process that that actually is cured. Um, our goal is to be able to use technology similar, similar to this to be able to shorten the cure cycle, especially on big high risk type coupons. Part of that effort involves um, a microwire that we use for uh, collecting temperature data out in the laminate itself. You can see where we've got a, a couple of antenna right here on the backside of the of a tool. We also can put the antenna on the bag. These are all developmental pictures, so things have advanced quite a bit from that. But if if you can see the little uh, uh, the little wire there. Uh, with the orange background on that adhesive, you can see how small it is. It falls into the area of uh, under the effect of defects type uh, size. And so it can be used in many structures actually in the composite to, uh, part laminate and not in the, just on the mold or on the edges. That gives you a lot more visibility to the actual temperatures in that part. So we're we're in a a, a bunch of different uh, technologies. We we you know we work with the different industries. We try to uh, bring new technology to the forefront. We participate in SBIR activity. We participate in project development, those kinds of things, so that our company can be on the leading edge, really, of uh, uh, knowledge in composite training so that when we teach you, we have some background um, in what's coming down the pike as well as what, what we've been doing for the last 40 years. So with that, um, I will put my contact information up there real quick and turn it back over to Dale Brocious. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Lou. We've obviously hit the end of the hour and, and there was a question that uh, came in about uh, wind turbine blades and you answered that is and then there's a uh, uh, one on how do you repair damaged uh, damaged composite part. I think uh, uh, we have uh, that person's email and we'll uh, get that to you and you can have that. Yeah, we uh, we can teach them all about repairing damaged parts. We're good <laughs> and at I, that. And I and I can vouch for you, uh, Abra's you know training. I sent I've sent pe people to Abra's back in the day when I was running a composite shop and you know people had never seen a piece of pre in their life came back and could could actually do a perfect pleat in a, in a vac in a com vacuum bag on a complex part. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's definitely a good thing you guys do. So that wraps up uh, this week's or this month's episode. Our next episode will be on February 20th. That's a Tuesday. We're normally on Mondays, but because that Monday is a, is President's Day holiday, we will hold the, the next episode on Tuesday, the 20th. So again, thank all of our speakers, Neil, Joe, Hisham, Lou, you know, appreciate all your contributions today and we will wrap it up. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye now.